Hey, thank you for joining us today. Kenny Porter here, KP's Black Box, and I have the um, honor and privilege of being able to interview one of my new friends in life, um, who not only I've learned to love, but my pets have learned to love. Um, Dr. Jeffrey Stupler, uh, retired now veterinarian. Uh, Dr. Stupler. Thank you for having me, Kenny. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's going to be fun today, so I'm excited to talk to you about being an entrepreneur who just happened to practice veterinary medicine for how many years? 39. 39 years. And going. And and from the sound of your voice, you practice veterinary practice or medicine in, in the Deep South. Yes. Yeah. The, uh, s- Northern <laughs> Westchester. <laughs> Southern New York State. Wow. And how many? Thir- 30? I graduated in uh, March of 1982. What school? University of Parma, Italy. University of Parma, like the Parmesan Parma? cheese? Parma, okay. Parma ham? Italy. Okay. Now, there's an interesting story that we got to stop before we get into vet medicine. So, um, tell me about that. How, how are you off what, the boat Italian? Is that the right? I am not Italian whatsoever. <laughs> I knew several words in Italian, some I, I cannot say. Uh, some of them were Leaning Tower of Pisa, <laughs> baked lasagna, and pizza. That was okay. the only Italian I knew. We speak the same Italian. Then. Yes. Yeah. When I was applying to veterinary school, for some reason, everyone considered it the um, pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, okay. and everybody wanted to go to veterinary school. However, the laws up until the, the I think, the late 70s said that if you, have, if you live in a state that has a veterinary college, you can only apply to that veterinary school. At, wow. the, at the time, it was, there were only 18. So because I lived in New York and we had Cornell University, there were 65 spots open, 50 spots for, for New York residents, 15 spots for other residents okay. and foreign students. However, if you lived in New Jersey, you could apply anywhere you wanted to go because they didn't have a school. Yeah. So someone, I met somebody, and he said, um, I just came back from Italy. Just go, learn Italian, come back, get your degree, and you'll be fine. So I did. And that, that degree in Italy, veterinary medicine, is recognized in the States? Yes, I had to take a test as a foreign graduate. Okay. They wanted to make sure that I spoke English when I got here. <laughs> and there's uh, a little difficulty because I'm from Brooklyn, so I spoke Brooklynese. Brooklynese. Bro- Brooklynese. Brooklynese. Yeah, <laughs> and I passed the English test with no problem. I passed the uh, foreign graduate test with no problem. I passed the New York State with no problem. I was, a, I was the first person in nine years to get 100% in the test, which what? I was very happy wow. about. One of my friends was the proctor, and he said, you did great on the test. So, Wow. And I've just been practicing ever since. That is crazy. You know, we um, before we get too deep into this, I, I always like to start um, our podcast with um, honoring our, our nation's military, and I, I know you're um, a, a big supporter of the military as well. Sure. So, um, and, and what's interesting in, in veterinary medicine, I'll, I'll share some stories with you with some of my uh, clients that are in the special forces community, and some of the, the most amazing troops on our planet are also the four-legged ones mm. um and you know there's some stories that even as early as last night went to dinner with a close friend of mine who was uh, uh part of the seal team and some of the stories that he had shared with us last night about uh these warriors the four-legged warriors and the the life that they've laid down to make sure that they protected their two-legged friends, the upright humans who are causing all this crap to begin with most of the time, right? Mm -hmm. Um, But he showed me some pictures of a Belgium that he he owned, who's passed now. Belgian Malinois. Malinois, yeah. Um, And how beautiful this animal was with his children and friends and family. But if you didn't know this dog in his prior life, he was a terror to a train the killer. world. Ter- yes. And terrorists were literally running for their lives from this dog. Um, so I'd like to 
make a toast today to our four-legged veterans, uh, to the Belgians, the German shepherds, and uh, you probably know better than I do. I'm sure they the military has all kinds of four-legged. Mostly, mostly Malinois. Malinois. And they're incredible. Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah. cheers to our, our yep. military and our four-legged yep. friends. Chentani. Chentani. Know what that means? Uh, what, who did Lift I just curse? Lift the glass? Live to 100 years. Live to 100 years. All right. Mm. Or salute. A salute. Nice. Not bad, right? A little uh, Johnny Walker blue label. We're, we're trying to get Johnny Walker to be friends of our podcast. Or come over more? Yeah. And just, uh, you know, we don't need a big check, but send us some bottles that we can share with. And some glasses. We're good. It'd be awesome. It's for a blended scotch. Not bad, right? You're, no, not at all. You're a connoisseur. I'm a bourbon guy. What? Oh, wow. Okay, what's your what's your favorite uh, spirit in the bourbon world? Woodford Reserve is excellent. Tasty. Uh, what's the other one? Trace something. Buffalo Trace. Buffalo Trace. Buffalo Trace. Excellent. Yeah. Really, really good. Have you had any of our our local spirits here in uh, I have Beach? Not. Tarnished Truth. Uh, we were there once we visited. Beautiful, beautiful place. Cavalier Hotel is a magnificent building, a historic building. Isn't it? Gorgeous. Great to go to. Yeah. It's a treasure. So, you know, they have a um, they have a distillery yeah, there downstairs. in the bottom, <laughs> bottom of the old hotel. We'll have to go to dinner there one night. Uh, done. My treat. Let's do it. We, I was there Am last I going to say no? <laughs> you, you better not. <laughs> Let's do it. Um, and we'll do a, uh, a bourbon tasting there. Pretty fun. Have you done that yet? Have you done their tasting? I have not. Because Jen yeah. doesn't drink. Oh, yeah. yeah. Jen, by the way, is his lovely wife. My wife. Yeah. So she's my designated driver. <laughs> How about, she could be our Beautiful. designated driver, Let's which is it. perfect. Can we bring Noah? Absolutely. Yeah, we'll bring And Ian? We'll bring Ian. Absolutely. Yeah. I just saw Noah say yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's always always fun to have those guys along. Absolutely. Well, I, I made him a perfect them. Manhattan a couple of times when he came to my house. No kidding. He enjoyed it. Nice. That's what I drink. It is perfect now? Perfect. Okay. All right. So, uh, again, bringing this back to a to, uh, little bit more about you and your profession. So you, you go to this vet school in Italy. Mm-hmm. You come back, you score perfect scores on New York State. You, yeah. And New York State, you know, uh, in my industry, in the financial services industry, they're kind of known as the – They were the, tough. They're tough. It was a two-day – test the physical test that you had to age a horse you had to block a a cow's teat for mastitis testing and laceration repair you had to almost do everything but more you had to show what you were going to do okay so we gotta we gotta go back on some terms here for a sec you you blocked the horse oh you had to i I blocked horses in football all the time no no you had to tell age a horse's teeth that's how you find out how old they are and by the time you get back there, after like 500 people have pulled this poor horse's tongue out, they're not happy. <laughs> so they're, they're bucking. Uh, and you had to go through poisonous plants. They would have a bottle yeah. of water and just tell what that plant is. But the students before peeled off a lot of the flowers so yeah. that, that they would ruin your chances of telling what it was, which was not very nice. Oh, wow. So it was two excruciating days of testing. And you got 100 on that. Got so, 100. Wow. I scored um, better than the Cornell boys. What was the what was the teat word? Is that is that so for, for let's, let's say vulgar tit is for that? a no? That's the medical term for <laughs> mammary gland. And uh, <laughs> if a cow has a laceration on one of its teats and you have to block it because you're not going to anesthetize the cow just for that, yeah. so you have to pick out the right needle and pick out the right anesthesia for it. Some are good, some are not good, and have to describe how you're going to do it. So, you know, Ian. My son-in-law over here, who makes all the magic happen with the right. the video and his right hand man there, know on the audio. Th- these are Midwest guys, right? Well, Ian, kind of Lynchburg, Virginia, but his family had uh, black. Was it Black Angus Ian? Mm-hmm. Dairy farm in uh, in Pittsburgh, right outside of Pittsburgh. Noah's wife owned a farm. A farm. Yeah. And so you know, it's a whole different game. It, it, it's just crazy. It's, I had be, before I could go into. I was applying to veterinary school to Cornell. Since I was a Brooklyn boy, and the only animals I came across were rats, dogs, and cats. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I wanted to have large animal experience. So yeah. I volunteered to work on a farm in McConnellsburg, <coughs> Pennsylvania, in the middle of nowhere. Okay. They had one traffic light. And it was the most incredible experience of my life. You're up every morning at 445, 450, and you don't stop the day until everything is taken care of. I, had, I thought I knew what hard work was, but I was fooled. I had no clue. Mm-hmm. Going up and unloading bales of hay when it's like 125 degrees in a barn, my fingers were bleeding. My feet were bleeding at the end of the day. After about two weeks and I was ready to quit, I just took a deep breath and I, was, I, I passed through it. And I was able to do I was spent the whole summer there and it was the most incredible experience of my life and the people were wonderful. Yeah. Seven days a week they work. Wow. They let me sleep on Sunday mornings. They gave me <laughs> Sunday mornings. I slept from Saturday night at 9 o'clock to 12 o'clock lunch on Sunday. So... Listening to that, Dr. Stoppler, do you think that one of the key ingredients to um, doing well in anything in life is just passion? That sounds like a lot of passion. That passion you... and hard work. Yeah. It's hard to replace those two, right? No one gets to the top without all the stuff on the bottom. Yeah. Yeah, that success that people look at, that's a, that's a great point there. That uh, right at the top of uh, that iceberg. You know, it's not what was above the water that sunk the Titanic. It's all the things you didn't see. And, um, you know, I think every entrepreneur, whether if you're in the financial business or you're doing veterinary medicine or uh, any other type of medicine or tax work, uh, like our friend Randy out there on the other side, um, it consists of those words, hard work, persistence, late nights. How many late nights do you have? And when you were running your vet when practice. I graduated from veterinary school before I had my own practice, I think there was I graduated in eighty two I started my practice in ninety one so there's about nine years of me working for other people. yeah, I did my internship at the Animal Medical Center in Manhattan, which was the greatest place to train. Then I had seven jobs, so I worked a total of eighty five to a hundred hours a week, Jeez. seven days a week for eleven straight years, and then I set up my practice i tried to I was supporting my then family. And I was saving up money to get my own practice. And the only way I could do it is by working for people who were, who are, I'm a Jewish, but there were other people who didn't work on Jewish holidays, so they elected me to work for them. Yeah. I, got, I got paid more money. I worked on January 1st. I worked on July 4th, Christmas Day, in the emergency hospital in, Manhattan, in, uh, in Queens to make extra money hmm. for things that I needed. Because when I came out of school, I had debt. Wow. Forty thousand dollars of debt back then in 1982, which is a lot of money. Wow. Hey, no, I run a quick calculation. Inflation adjusted debt, so forty thousand. Forty thousand dollars in 2020. What's the inflation adjusted um, value? What would that be in today's dollars? I, I'm going to guess two hundred thousand, maybe three hundred thousand. The veterinarians who are graduating now are coming out between two and four hundred and fifty thousand dollars in debt. Wow. So let's um let's talk about that group of people today. In in your opinion, you know, hard work, um, personal responsibility, persistence, sacrifices, discipline, criticism. You know, wh- what do you? What's the hope that you see for? young veterinarians today and entrepreneurs in general? Unfortunately, many of them are coming out and they want to be the CEO of the business. They don't want to put in the hard time. Mm. Mm. They don't want to work the extra hours when they come out. And this is just, that's just the way it is. That's yeah. just the way society has been now. Um, they want the best hours. They want that work-life relationship and ratio and when I came out of one job, I went to another job, and I made house calls every night to almost 1, 2 o'clock in the morning. Wow. For going from people's houses and apartment houses, I'd do a whole floor of animals. And then I would drive back when I moved to Westchester. I'd drive back from Brooklyn, where I used to live, and I'd drive the hour and a half north. So I'd get home at one thirty, two o'clock in the morning and be back at work by 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock the next morning for someone else. You know, 27 years in my business is a... Uh, financial advisor to 
a very diverse client base from government contractors to veterinary. Sure. That secret recipe seems to be the same. Hard work, persistence, late nights, rejection, sacrifices, discipline, criticism, doubts, failure, risk. And even in my own life, I've, I've had some failure. I've, I've taken some risks that then equated to failure. Um, where, where's the hope in this that you see with the next generation? What, what, what encouragement can you give young people who are coming out of vet school? It's not all about you. You have to work and gain experience and gain knowledge. Just because you went to school for four years doesn't mean you learn everything. Yeah. The week you're gone out of school, and that you're a years, dinosaur. So help me understand, uh, in order to become a, a veterinary veterinarian, what's, what's the education pipeline? So four years of college, okay. undergraduate. Your undergrad. Four years of veterinary school. Wow. It's not mandatory to take postgraduate training. I did about a year and a half of an internship at the Animal Medical Center in Manhattan, but because I wanted to specialize in small animal medicine and surgery, most people just go right into practice when they pass their boards. So even in medical, the medical profession, you have to be a board-certified person. You must do an internship and a residency. So in veterinary medicine, they get out after the four years of veterinary school, they get a job, and then they think it's on easy street. Yeah. It's not the way it is. Wow. And they're having a hard time because their debt is so much, according to the amount of money, that there's nothing left for them. Hmm. So when I said to people recently, why don't you get a second job or a third job, they looked at me like I had two heads. <laughs> why would I want to do that? Right. I want my weekends free and my holidays free. And I said, I would have enjoyed them too, but I didn't have the choice. Yeah. That's important. That's right. Okay. The knowledge I've stored, the, the hard work that I've done, the hours I put in has made me a better person. And to this day, even though I'm supposed to be retired and I'm, I'm working one or two days a week now, I'm doing three or four hours of webinars on, online and, and, every week. And, and let's, you know, I, I obviously have to walk a thin line in talking about your stuff and what I know about you financially, but... Uh, I'll say this sitting on this side of the table. You don't have to go to work. You choose because you look at retirement as going to work because you want to, not because you have to. Is that is that fair? So after we moved out, after I moved down here and sold my practice, there was 10, 11 months I did nothing but shop and cook and <laughs> unpack and <laughs> make dinners for Jen and I. And then I said, I really want to get back to work because I have 39 years of experience and knowledge. I'm not using it. So I called up this Banfield Pet Hospital, and I'm working for them part-time. And the first day I walked in, I said, wait, this is like being home to me. Mm. It's what I do. Yeah. It's who I am. Yeah. That's beautiful. So being a veterinarian professional is just part of your DNA now. It's Even though I'm in pain because I'm handicapped, it doesn't hurt when I'm practicing medicine. Wow. Uh, it hurts when I come home yeah. because there's so much benefit to what I do. Yeah. Um, so take me back to when you first opened your own private practice. What kind of, you know, think about that from the rejections, the sacrifices, the discipline, the criticism. Down at the bottom of that picture up there is risk. How much financial risk did you take to open your own personal? In terms of dollars? Dollars and, you know, obviously Time. there's family sacrifice there, right? I sacrificed everything as soon as I opened my own practice just to make the money to, to, make the money to pay the contractors. I was working day in and day out. I was making house calls from 8 o'clock in the morning till 10 o'clock at night. And I was basically giving my, the money I made to the contractor, and my family didn't see me. I was never home. I came mm -hmm. home after there was, the kids were asleep. I left every morning. I was in my office at 6.45 a.m. six days a week. Mm -hmm. Sundays I took off, and I just went in about 9 o'clock because those were the days we used to hospitalize animals. So I had to go back every night about 11.30 walk the dogs, change the litter boxes for the cats, clean up vomitus, clean up diarrhea, reset catheters. 
Make mm-hmm. sure there were medications given. Uh, call people, call the owners just to tell them that I was there. Because many people thought when I said I'm coming back tonight at 1130, they didn't realize that I was really coming back. So they said, would you call me? I said, absolutely, I'll call you. And they were fast asleep, and they said to me, you did promise you'd call. Yeah. I said, and I called. And on Sundays, little Saturday nights I had to go back. Sundays, if I had animals in the hospital, I was in the morning, afternoon, and twice at night, and 7 o'clock and about 11 o'clock at night. Wow. So sacrifice, yeah. got to be larger, though. The, the word is too small. Hmm. And the people coming out now just don't want to do that. They look at me like I have two heads. They don't want to do that. They figured they did everything right. They went to the best high schools, colleges, veterinary school, and they know everything, and now the money is going to come pouring in. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. Hmm. If you, back then, if you placed an hourly wage on the time, effort, and you as an entrepreneur, what your what your hourly wage was being the chief cook, chief bottle washer. Chief cook and bottle washer? Yeah. I did that. I, I think it was about 4 or $5 an hour is what I made. Wow. After everything was said and done, that's what I was able to put in my pocket. Which brings me back to it wasn't about the money. It wasn't <clears> about <throat> the money. No. That's interesting. The, <clears throat> the, the generation before me had it, I won't say easier, it wasn't easier for them, but their costs were less, and they didn't have more rules. than like We have to have uh, licensed veterinary technicians. The veterinarian I worked for when I was in college didn't have to have that, so he just had a, people, and he paid a couple of bucks an yeah. hour or two. So it was different then. People who loved animals and had a passion for work. Yeah, and, yeah. and they just they worked. Now you have to pay a good salary, $20, 30 $40 an hour, for a licensed veterinary technician, at least up in New York. Yeah. Down here, I think it's a little less. And how much schooling does a person have to go through to get that? For a technician, the minimum of two years, two okay. years of, of college. Okay. You, I think uh, TCC has a program that's a two-year program. Most of the people that I and work— And TCC, for those who don't know, is Tidewater Community, Community college, college here in Virginia and Beach. North I also, one of my seven jobs— was teaching at uh, Mercy College in their technology, veterinary technology program. I did that for 15 years. So I go in after my long day of working mm. from 8 o'clock in the morning to 6 o'clock at night. I went over and I taught pharmacology and toxicology Monday nights from 6 o'clock to 9 o'clock. I did that for about 15 years. Wow. Um, if, if I can s- segue a little bit and talk about pets and talk about how we and you, you've been so kind and generous and you know helping my family and I and you're not you're not technically my my vet you've just been a good friend who happens to have expertise in veterinary medicine um, and so you know I got a, a new mastiff because we lost Brady of nine years and we've got a German Shepherd who's batshit crazy <laughs> Betsy I love her but she's crazy I hope you can say that on the air right yes yeah. <laughs> Betsy if you're listening I still love you. <laughs> Um, but what do you see in today's relationship with, uh, you know, the, the patient, the pet and the owner? Pets right now are not considered pets. They are considered part of the family. Hmm. As certain people in the room can tell you, they sleep with their puppy. Yeah. It's a child to them. Yep. Right, Noah? Yeah. So... Many people are having pets to see if they would be good parents. Hmm. And How's Noah doing? <laughs> pretty well. <laughs> pretty well. Should we let him? Yes. Let him hold a baby. Procreate. <laughs> Procreate. Yes. 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 Okay. Uh, many people are having pets and opting not to have children. Mm-mm. Because of the expense, et cetera, yeah. or because their lifestyle doesn't allow them to, or because their ages are different. So I don't talk to people like it was their pet. I talk to them like it's their child, yeah. four-legged, furry child. I hate to say that, but I, I have a name, so I, I use their name, yeah. like Lily, or I saw two Lunas yesterday, Lunas, and I talk to them because th- they're concerned. Hmm. People come to tears when I talk to them. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. We were just talking you about Brady. Yeah. yeah, you talk about Brady, and I'll... I'll uh, it's like okay, where's the onions? Yeah, I'm, I'm cutting it. And what's what's amazing about this is I'm just having a conversation right now, and I can see yeah. the passion 
in your eyes for other people's pets. So you take your job really, really seriously. Um, all right, Jeff, you're going to make me, make me start trying to stop. But you don't find that. You know, you don't find that kind of passion. And, and it's, uh, that's what I want to get back to in you society. You have to have the fire in your belly. Yeah. You must. There are a lot of people who came out, and they're disillusioned. They put in all that time. They're not getting paid back what they thought they would. And then they're unhappy. Yeah. And they just don't have that passion. Yeah. It's unfortunate. You know, I, f- I find that to be true in all successful people, regardless of their profession. That, you know, our friend Randy out there, um, who's a tax professional, he's, he's one of the uh, state's top tax experts in the industry. Um, to him, it's not about money. He hates seeing people pay more tax than what they should. And he is so passionate about that that because of that passion, he and his team of, of tax experts in, in Nashville, um, it, it shows through with the relationship that he has with, with his clients. And that shows through to me, and that's why I wanted to have you on the show today because in conversations you and I have had about um, your personal finances and planning, what I found so intriguing with you and so uh, infectious was your your passion for your profession as a veterinarian and veterinary medicine, that you care about each patient um, as if they were a human being, as a soul, as a life. And that's that's beautiful. So I commend you for that. Thank you. Um, what um, – and we're going to try to make this happy, smiley, and take this back a little – uh, not too sappy dudes here uh, crying about their pets. Um, t- tell me some funny stories. Do you, you have anything early in your career? Like, I'll share one with you. So my, my uncle Robert, and I think I'd shared this with you before, uh, was a, a small farmer in Durham, North Carolina, and raised black Angus, and was a very generous man, shared, you know, the bounty with family members. And so it was really more hobby, that passion right. thing, than it was trying to make income from it. But he did okay, you know, for, you know, old country boy, he, he did all right. But I got my experience of, of farm life hanging out with him. My father was a Baptist minister, but I'd go hang out with my Aunt Julie and Uncle Robert. And one of my most fond memories that I have of, of farm life was helping the vet deliver a breached calf um so jeff this this uh this veterinarian um he he put on this big glove big white glove um and he went up in the the vaginal tunnel Mm -hmm. of this mama who was in severe pain and he's like oh yeah and if you can see me on camera he's was a rather tall guy like yourself, uh, probably six three, six four, mm-hmm. and uh, really long arms. And all I remember is he was shoulder deep in this black Angus and goes, Oh, I know the problem. Turning that calf around. Turning that calf around. And the, the experience that he gave me is when he got the legs out of that calf, guess what he asked little 10 year old Kenny to do? Throw some gloves on. <laughs> Grab a leg. <laughs> and I, I had my first experience in delivering um, uh, uh, a soul into the world. So why don't you become a veterinarian? It scared the shit out of me. <laughs> <laughs> I was traumatized. <laughs> uh, you know, th- th- that was my first experience with sex. <laughs> <laughs> Bestiality, I guess. <laughs> Um, but it was, it was really cool. And, you know, mom came over, I, I've got this little calf on the ground. He's got all the membrane. What is yeah. that stuff called? Amniotic fluid. Yeah. And what's the, like the gel crap that was all over this calf and the, the, the goop, we'll call it the goop that was on, okay. on the calf. And the mom comes over and starts licking it, licking it off. Yep. But that little calf is laying in my lap mm. as a 10 year old. And I, I can envision that now. I can see that little black calf, you know, laying there and, and mom coming over after all of that pain was like, oh, thanks for helping me. 
It, it was beautiful. I loved it. it you got to have a million experiences like that over 39 I, years. One of the strangest things ha- that happened to me when I was on the farm in McConnellsburg, Pennsylvania, I swear that they had a bull, and the bull's name was Kenny. I'm oh. not, I'm not, <laughs> Are you making that up? No, his name was Kenny. And I said, who names their, their bull Kenny? <laughs> Every morning at about 4.30 when he was getting ready to go get put in the paddock for breakfast, he would come by my window and wake the Brooklyn kid up. <laughs> and I'd hear this horrible noise. <laughs> at 4.30 in the morning, every single morning. He just wanted to know to say, I'm the king of this farm. Mm-hmm. And he was... Mag- he probably said effing farm, too. That's oh, what I'm saying. He yeah. was magnificent. And then one day they said, we have, Jeff, we have to move the bull from that paddock to that paddock. I said, okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to open up that fence and open up this fence, and we're going to stand there and make believe we're a fence. I said, <laughs> we're going to make believe we're a fence? Yeah, just hold your arms like this and put your legs out. And I said, oh, God. So what, what kind of bull? Is this one of those aggressive bulls, or was he? No, he was, he was on the farm for many years. It was... Um, I think they got him in one of the fairs because of his high butter mu- buttermilk content or butterfat content. Hmm. And they had about 85 to 100 Holstein cows. So he was wow. a Holstein bull. And I'm telling you. So he, they would stud him. So he would yeah, go around. Oh yeah, and, impregnating everyone. Yeah. So He was the I, we, gigolo. We, yeah, we came out. and I'm standing like this. Kenny, the gigolo. Kenny. And... The bull walks past me and looks at me, and the urine started to run down my leg into the boots <laughs> because I was so terrified. <laughs> because in one second, he could have launched me to the moon. And he just turned around and just walked into the paddock. Thank God. <laughs> <sighs> my life could have been over. My reproductive career would have been over. <laughs> and it was terrifying. Looking back... I'm smiling. I was terrified. I was 21 years old in the best shape of my life, and I felt like I was about a half an inch tall when he looked at me. Yeah, a bull like that is probably, what, 800 pounds? Oh, more. Maybe 1,200 pounds? More. More. Oh, yeah. I oh, think well. he was solid muscle. What do you think, Noah? Like a ton? Yeah. 2,000 2, pounds. pounds of solid muscle. Yeah. Wow. So... I learned a lot that year. Yeah, I was way off of my calculations. Yeah, don't have me do your financial math. It, oh, the most <laughs> I was bought. Is that what I was? Okay. Um, so, your your is there a way to ask you your favorite animal to treat your what's my what's favorite your, animal? I love dogs and cats. I. I worked at an all-cat practice for about two, two and a half years of my career because my best friend at the time had a cat hospital in Queens, New an York. An all-cat practice? All cat I didn't know that you get that specialized? In, in New York. Just think about it. In yeah. three city blocks, you could have 5,000 patients in apartment houses. Wow. So it was amazing. But coming from my internship, which was noisy because all the dogs are barking in the kennels, you walk into the cat practice... And all you hear is maybe a cat scratching in a litter box hmm. and a little urine coming out, and that was it. Hmm. The silence was deafening to me. Wow. Uh, to this day, I find cats intriguing because their sets of diseases are so different and they hide their disease as well. So when I'm brought up I- I before a cat that has a problem, I have to be like Sherlock Holmes to try to find out what's hmm. going on with the cat. The only problem is, is cats are not like dogs many of them could be aggressive they're terrified mom and dad chase them around the house <laughs> grab them pull their tails threw them into a carrier threw the carrier into the car they're terrified they're not in their regular environment cats love to do the same thing at the same time every single day and yeah. never vary their the creature of habit creature right. of habit they don't want their routine varied by the time they come to me they want to rip my eyes out so we have to figure out what's wrong with them 
doing what we can. Sometimes we have to sedate them. But my favorite pet of all times is probably the yellow Labrador retriever. Hmm. Hey, Noah, over there, the lab. You know what's going to be a close second to the lab today? Mastiffs. The Mastiffs. Yeah, we've got this new Mastiff. And, uh, you know, they they take on their owner's dispositions yes. really well. And so B is a lot like me, the Mastiff we have. Betsy's a lot like Kathleen. Bat, bat shit crazy? Yeah. It's got here. Oh, boy. I'm just kidding, honey. But... <laughs> um, so, you, you know, you, you, you've got these labs that you love, and, and what, what is it about their DNA? What is it about their makeup that makes them such a special dog? The Labrador as a breed is just so willing to please its owner. Mm. They thrive on human contact. They love human babies. I was just telling Noah before we started to shoot that even though Lucy may be a crazy little puppy right now, when, in, when they have children... And Lucy's Noah's dog, by the way. Yes, yeah. that dog can become a trained killer and will attack anyone who comes near that baby. It's a frightening thing to see because mm. it goes from being a happy lab with its tongue hanging out and it's enjoying life to wanting to kill someone coming near the baby. Wow. So I love labs because their, their temperaments are so wonderful. They love human contact. Uh, and they're always the same. They just love people. I had love of my life, Becky, from 1994 to 92, when did she pass away? 15 years ago, 2005. Or wow. two th- 2008, I think it was. So she lived to be 15 and a half years old. Wow. And I diagnosed her myself. She had cancer of her spleen. Mm-hmm. That was bleeding into her belly, just like Slip your dog. Brady, yeah. I diagnosed her myself, and I had to put her to sleep myself. Oh gosh, Jeff. Okay, don't take us there anymore. That's that. That sucks. Um, but that's that's the passion that people have for their their pets. They they're not pets. They're an extension of the family. She was the greatest dog. All my clients tell me that their dogs are the greatest. I would sleep with her on the floor downstairs in the basement because she was too scared to go up on a couch or a bed and because I came home so late one two o'clock in the morning I threw some old blankets together and every night when I came in from the garage her tail would be wagging and happy to see me and say dad I love you but you gotta take me for a walk (laughs) and I said Becky it's snowing it's about 15 degrees outside it's awful and she said dad I know, but I really got to go. <laughs> and I'd take her out, and she would just romp around. She'd eliminate and want to play in the snow and drag me all over, and that's just the way life happens to be. And then we come back in, and we fall asleep together in each other's arms. That's how good she like, was. Wow. Yeah. And, and you're glad. Thanks for taking me on that walk, Becky. Right? <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, you're a very passionate guy about animals, and so this is going to be a tough question for you to answer. Shoot. What is the diabolical animal to work with? Is there a list, or is it easy? And for folks who have this animal you're about to say, we're, we're not saying that. Jen is going to hate me because <laughs> it's the chihuahua. The little chihuahua that comes in in someone's arms. Drop the chalupa. That (laughs) as soon as I put my hands out, wants to rip my fingers off my wrist. They like one person and one person only, and everybody else is dead meat, (laughs) especially me. Thank God they're small, right? But when I met Jen, she had a chihuahua that saved her life. Okay, because she had some problems years ago. And her dog was always there for her. Wow. And he was the nicest chihuahua. Wow. And I'll never forget, this before we were going out, before we married, she brought Ren. Like Ren and Stimpy? I mean, I'm sorry, not Ren. Uh, <laughs> Rue to see me. And I said, I have to take some blood tests. I'll have to put a muzzle on him. He says, oh, no, you don't muzzle my dog. I said, well, chihuahuas are known to try to kill me, not my dog. <laughs> Everyone says that about their dog, sure. not my dog. Right. 
And they see I have my fingers, so they say, well, how bad can it be? He's got all 10 of his fingers. So I said, all right, I'll trust her because you know, she's good looking. She's a doctor, so yeah. maybe she knows what's yeah. going on. Yeah. Son of a gun, I took the blood test from him. No muzzle. He was great. Then we started going out. Then we got engaged. And he became my best little friend. As a matter of fact, he slept on my side of the bed, not with Jen. Ah. Two-timing. Yeah. <laughs> so he was my best little buddy. But we had to put him down two years ago uh, for heart yeah. disease. Uh-uh. That hurt. Yeah, I mean, they, they're, they're part of your family. We've had two uh, shepherds in our lifetime that Kat and I, um, if you say the word buddy in front of Kathleen right now, she will tear up and yeah. get emotional about it. That that shepherd died young, nine years old. Too young. And basically had MS and anal fissures and all kinds of rough stuff. Couldn't fix it. Yeah. And so it was better to put him down. The worst part of pet ownership is that it's for a finite period. Mm. It's not 60, 70 years, 80 years. It's for 10, 15 years. Mm. And you know that day is going to come, and yeah. you never want to face it. And the, the, the tough thing is it happens fast a lot of times, like with Brady. It, it happened faster than, you know, Cat was out of town. And then I, you know, I got to be the undertaker. It wasn't, wasn't yeah. fun. Um, so, again, man, I, you know, I don't, want, I don't want to make this too dreadful and, and, and sad today. But um, I think all the listeners out there who have pets can empathize with both of us and in, in the pain, the anguish you go through when you lose a family member. And a four-legged, it, it hurts the same it's terrible um but you know when you when you look at veterinary medicine and you think about that from an entrepreneur point of view as a guy who spent 39 years in the industry passionate about the industry passionate about animals and i should say it's even beyond that now because you're you're probably working on 40 years now 41 years yeah uh because you're still doing it um what what is what advice would you give a young vet who wants to take that risk and start their own practice? Be prepared to give up and sacrifice your personal life, your weekends, your holidays, your kids' activities. It's very, very hard, almost impossible to live both lives. Hmm. So if you're going to be a veterinarian and donate or dedicate all that time to your practice and your patients, something has to be sacrificed, and that's mm. usually your family. Mm. That's the hard part. Mm. If you can have a great big practice and you have multiple people, you're open seven days a week, that's terrific. But that comes later on in life. It, yeah. doesn't, it doesn't happen all at once. Is there a way to integrate if you – let's say you're that person who's passionate like you were or are about veterinary medicine and they – they, they want to venture into that world of, of being an entrepreneur and starting their own practice. And they have a family already. Is there a way f- to involve the family? Is there a way to integrate the kids? When I was married years and years ago and I had my practice, my son, who was little at the time, he would come with me on Saturday nights and Sundays, and he would help me walk the dogs. He would clean the cages with me, and he got to know the dogs, and the dogs liked him, and they kissed him. There would be a couple that used to come back in who were bored with me who were diabetic, so they needed to someone who knew how to monitor um, sugar levels and hmm. give insulin appropriately. So he enjoyed it, but he became an architect. And that's something. So yeah. uh, when, when, when I think a lot of kids see who are children of veterinarians how much time their parents have to put in, yeah. they decide not to do it. You know, I can empathize with that. I was a preacher's kid, right? And so in, in faith and religion, and I saw, you know, with my father, I love people, but, you know, that's, that's when you decide to be a, a man of the cloth, that's a big, big commitment, and you're, you're out here with these people all the time, and some of them love you, and some of them hate you, and they'll go have stewed, we call it stewed preacher for lunch. It's almost uh, like being a politician. Yeah, right. And so that balance, I was just like, mm, no, you know what? I love people, but I'm going to find a different profession to, to help people in. Follow the money. 
Yeah, that's <laughs> right. Well, a follow lot of the pre- money. There's some preachers out there that follow the money. I yeah, understand. Yeah, yeah right. Uh, sorry, preachers, I'm picking on your, your not your. Well, the hardest thing is that once you sign on the bottom, on the dotted line about having a practice, yeah, you're you have to pay salaries. Yeah, you have to pay tax. You have to pay the rent. You have to pay the electricity and the advertising and the phone and the heating bill and, and so. You don't get time off. There were days that I had influenza that I went to work. Mm-hmm. There was no getting sick. My back is bad, and I would just put my, my brace on, and I'd have to wow. f- work through it. Yeah. And if I was in pain, I was in pain. Yeah. If I had to cry, I cried. There were days in surgery that it hurt so bad that I cried. That, and you still have to do it because you have those expenses. You make your money giving knowledge and medicine and surgery to your patients, it is still a business. No matter how passionate I am, the business of running the business is more important than the actual business. And that's the sad thing. That was probably the most taxing part for you, right? Was just having, once you were done with your patients. Yeah, the taxes. The taxes, right? Yeah, what what a racket our federal government has. Yeah, and then you see, wait a second, I worked 85 to 100 hours a week for the entire year, I haven't taken a vacation in 11 years. That's all I have to show for this? Yeah, when you think about it, that's a, that's a great point. I should set up my own government. That's right. <laughs> it's easier. Yeah, some people tried that a few months ago over in Seattle, right? Uh, the, the Chaz and the Chops. How'd that work out? Yeah, right. <laughs> but, you, but there's a balance in that, I think. You know, when you look at, at the federal government, what, what, a, what a great plan for them is that they – become a silent partner who gets a distribution, let's call it a third. For some folks, it's more. Maybe for some, it's, it's less. But in order to have less, you made less. So when you look at that as a business owner, you, you've got this silent partner who's always there going, hey, Jeff, uh, you took a distribution this week. Um, send me my third. And we want our third out of uh, your, your 100%. But that silent partner is not coming in on Sunday night and cleaning up not diarrhea right. and vomit. Yeah. I never see him. And oh, by the way, if you have a bad month, we, uh, we don't want to make a capital contribution back in. We don't want to put money back into the practice. How many times as an entrepreneur can you remember where maybe you took a distribution, you took some money out, and you're like, crap, wasn't the best month, and so I, you have to infuse money in or have to take I've a loan. I've done it many, many times. I never took a loan, but I put it for my own money into the practice, yeah. and I remember early in having my own practice, so I was out already for 10, 12 years, and I said, wow, there's so much money in the checking account, and then I realized it was probably uh, uh, Columbus Day, so there was no mail, so the bills didn't come, <laughs> so the next day, twice as many bills, bills came, and I said, no <laughs> wonder I had so much money in the checking account. <laughs> This goes to you, this goes to him, this goes to her, and I was right back in the same place. But yeah. over the years, you get a following, and people like you, they trust you, they see that you know what you're doing, and they know who you are. I gave all my clients, after the cell phones became popular, they all have my cell phone number, hmm. because veterinary medicine is not 9 to 5, Monday through Friday. Yeah, It's 20, 24-7, seven, seven days a week. And... People would call me on the weekends. I'd tell them what to do. Come in tomorrow morning, drop your pet off. I'll take care of him. Or maybe you need to go see the emergency facility over the weekend or a specialist. What do you think about that? to that point? You, you know, there's a lot of venture capital companies now. And they're, they're buying up well-run vet practices. We were talking about that off camera. Um, as someone who's still practicing veterinary medicine, do you think that's healthy for your industry uh, to see that consolidation taking place? I'm not sure. There's nothing wrong with it. I sold my practice to two venture capitalists who were partners, but I had a different circumstance. I had to get out because of disability, so I just literally left. I was going to – I told people I was going to throw the keys in the, in the, in the garbage hmm. and, and walk out the door, so I got a couple of bucks when I left. Uh, other people are selling for multiples of their their net income, yeah. And I didn't have that ability because I was disabled for the last twenty years of my my practice. Wow. So and I still worked every day. Wow. I just had to cut down the hours. 
instead of 100 hours a week or 85 hours a week, I cut down to about 35, 40, which is now considered full-time job. Yeah. Did you bring any underlings or bring in any? Uh, I had two associates okay. back in the 90s. I hired my first associate, and then I had two full-time associates, so I had some time off. But you had to sacrifice in the beginning and put the time in to get the following. So there was always your, all your appointments were booked, and people were coming in, and the money flow was coming in, and you were able to pay your bills. Yeah. And yeah. you had to raise your prices every year, or many, sometimes many times a year, because your cost of medicine went up. People would say, Dr. Stuppel, why is this so much more expensive? And I'd say, because it costs more to buy the product. Yeah. There was one third grade teacher that I remember. She came in to me, and I had to do, her, uh, do a dentistry on her dog and take out several diseased teeth. And she says, Dr. Stuppler, I see that the cost of doing the dentistry went up from last year. So I said, well, of course it has. And she looked at me surprised and said, well, why would that be? And I looked at her and I said, because of the cost of living, my insurance went up, my rent goes up, my salaries go up, my advertising goes up, my phone, all the things I need to pay. And she looked at me and says, but why are you raising your prices? <laughs> I said, because... I have to charge every person who walks in more so I can pay the higher cost of my bills. Yeah. And she didn't understand that. I said, I didn't want to insult her. I said, I understand that you get your checks every two weeks all year long, but they're not printed up in the basement of the school. <laughs> they come from my taxes. And I happen to live and work in the same school district that you work at. Yeah. You guys voted yourself a raise, so I have to raise my tax, my, my money to pay your taxes. She said, it doesn't work that way. I said, well, it's not one for one, but it does work that way. Yeah. So she didn't understand that. I love teachers, so I'm not insulting her. <laughs> About a year or two later, her husband, who worked for IBM, was on the front page of our local financial newspaper. Hmm. And he retired from Big Blue and he wanted to follow his passion. His passion was framing pictures. So he opened up a framing store. Yeah. And the line was, how can anyone make money when they have to pay rent and salaries and phone and blah, blah, blah? How could anyone make a living doing this? So I got some justification because her own husband went through it. When he worked for IBM, if he had a problem, all he had to do was call HR. They took care of it. Right Now, he is HR. He's the framer. Right. If the heat is not working, he's got to fix it. If the light's out, he's got to call the electrician. If the toilet's not working, he has to fix it. He's got to go buy the toilet paper. No one understands yeah. that it's a business. Right. And, and in that business, you, if you're not passionate, like you're passionate about You get angry. It. Yeah. I've seen that. a lot of veterinarians get angry because they – what their how their lives turned out is not what they thought. They thought it was going to be a, a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow hmm. and without putting in the hard work and the time. It's the time factor. Yeah. And they became very bitter, and they didn't want to give the best quality they could to their patients. They didn't want to go to meetings. They didn't want to go to travel to lectures like I used to do all the time. Yeah. Travel to nice places, New Orleans, uh, Key West, um, Philadelphia, not the nicest place in the world, but... <laughs> hey, Philly's you, not just some yeah, nice museums. You go, you go for education. Yeah. A lot of lectures in Boston. And they never wanted to go to get more education. And I, I won an award one year in New York. I did close to 400 hours of continuing education in one year. Wow. That's a lot of extra time besides working the 85 to 100 hours a week. 400? Yeah, we have about 26 hours in our industry. Mandatory. Yeah. Well, it, 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 was, it wasn't mandatory. I did that. Wow. Now it's mandatory in New York, 15 hours a year. Wow. And, and again, that just, you can't teach passion. You can't teach desire. So, you know, the young people that are coming up now who are, you know, at the, the Auburns and the other amazing vet schools. Virginia. For, uh, Maryland, Virginia. Right, have some great ones. Uh, UVA and uh, UVA has a really, or is it Virginia Tech? I think it's, uh, I think it's, it's Maryland Virginia Tech. I think it's called. I'm not okay. sure. Um, so 
these schools that teach veterinary medicine, um, what recommendation would you give the young people in like their minor? Would it be in business? Would it be marketing? That would help. Both of those would help. Yeah. Because you're selling yourself. I used to think that every time I walked into an exam room, it was like walking on stage. Everyone is examining me and critiquing me from the second I walk in and say hello, shake their hands, introduce myself, say hello to their pet. So you have to sell yourself. Mm. And knowledge speaks volumes. When they see that you know what you're doing, they feel comfortable. Mm. If they think that you don't know what you're doing or you are a little wishy-washy on certain things, people will eat you up and spit you out, especially in New York. Yeah. Down here, it's much more forgiving. Yeah, or at least to your face in the moment. <laughs> then, yeah. <laughs> New Yorkers, you just get it yes. straight, right? That, and I appreciate that. Yes, and they don't come back. Right. And then you see that you have people coming back and their friends. Most of my clients have become almost family to me. Hmm. I'm still in communication with them. I've always I've been gone now for almost two years. They're still calling me for for medical advice and what should they do because the veterinarian who took over my practice says A and I say well I'm not licensed in New York anymore but you may want to just ask them about B yeah that may be more appropriate so I like that and they became family I see them around the neighborhood in restaurants and shopping and. We just have a great time together. It was like one big happy family. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, so when you think about your, your industry from a, from a financial point of view, uh, someone goes in and starts a practice in 2020. Uh, uh, operationally, to get a single-member practice off the ground, w- what do you think their capital investment is going to be? Have to be close to a million dollars. Wow. Have to be. E- S- even if it's in... A rental, yeah. With all the equipment, the medications that you need, I'm thinking about a million dollars. I think when I set up my practice, it was done between two hundred and fifty and three hundred thousand dollars. But then I added on as things became as technology changed, we had lasers, Mm -hmm. we had ultrasounds, we had dental X-rays. So if you think about all those things and you put them into a practice now. That's right. You know, I, I I tend to forget that sometimes that the veterinarian is the dentist, the endodontist, mm-hmm. uh, the, the heart surgeon, surgeon, exactly the, the, the cardiologist, the dermatologist. You're probably one of the only professionals where we your, do it your, all. Your general practice really is expertise in each yes, area. That's exactly right. You're a general practitioner. I thought about specializing when I was doing my internship. But I don't know if I wanted to do the same thing every day. And I thought about, like, how do dentists cope every day looking at people's yeah. tonsils and their teeth? Yeah. I couldn't do that. I wanted the surprise of what's going to walk through the door. Is it going to be a lame dog? Is it going to be a pregnant dog? Is it going to be a euthanasia? Is it going to be a cardiac case? Mm. Is it going to be a dermatology case? Mm. I never knew, and I had to figure it out. That's amazing. Uh, you and I were talking a couple months ago about um, uh, neutering, spading. Um, and again, I don't want to ask you to give medical advice today and make it, un, you know, I, I don't know what you can and cannot say, but your opinion about neutering and spading too soon or. There's been a, uh, a plan around the world in the last, I think, six years. And many of the people in the universities, the DVM PhDs, think that we may have been spaying and neutering too soon, too young, Mm. and that many of the cardiac problems we're seeing, the cancer problems, and the orthopedic problems that we're seeing are due to neutering at a young age. So they did this five, six-year study around the world, and they just came out with the results, and it's breed by breed. So there are certain breeds, I think I told Noah this, that he maybe should spay his dog at nine months of age. We were always told six months of age before their first heat. Now they're saying maybe after the first heat, before the second heat cycle, Mm. is best to do the spaying for a female. And the neutering may be about like a year or so, if not maybe two years of age. Mm. Dogs are tearing their cruciate ligaments. Dogs are getting heart disease. And 
we're thinking that we can probably delay the onset or decrease the severity of those diseases by neutering and spaying later on in life. Wow. So you still recommend if a person's not wanting to, to breed or procreate their I pet? I would still recommend spaying and neutering okay. later on. Control the population. Yes. Yeah. There's too many unwanted pets. Just go down to any ASPCA, and they're full of dogs. They're making pleas all the time to please come down and help us and adopt something. Wow. As a matter of fact, the breed of today is a rescue dog. That's mm. like its own breed, and people have these great stories of the history of this pet, where he or she came yeah. from, and they love their, their rescues. Wow. So uh, adoption you would recommend for folks who Absolutely. aren't looking for a purebred. Absolutely. You, know. you may, there's certain things. With a, a breed dog, you're also getting a certain set of genetic problems that may arise. Yeah. With a crossbreed dog, or a, we used to call them mutts in right. Brooklyn. Uh, we it, use that term too. Yeah, yeah it's right. unknown. Yeah. You don't know what you're getting. Right. They may have had problems, but we can always sort those out, and we could deal with them with trainers and with medications like Prozac for puppies. We could make animals better. Prozac for puppies. Prozac for yeah. puppies. It's a, I, put a, I put a lot of animals on. There you wonder some, if some of your human patients are, like, taking the pet's pills sometimes? Well, it's funny because when I recommend <laughs> it, they always say, well, I'm on that. So like, can I give them my medicine? And I said, absolutely. Why not? <laughs> That's funny. You know, um, uh, often you hear, like um, – you know, the, there's uh, the dog version of ibuprofen or the pet version of ibuprofen. Or rim- Rimadil. Rimadil. Um, is that safe for a person to administer ibuprofen, human ibuprofen, to, to pets? No, no. Ibuprofen can cause a lot of gastric ulceration. It's, it's pretty dangerous. Yeah. So I would stay away from that. Yeah. The what, what other, like, self-remedies do you see folks doing that is really dangerous for their pets? I don't know about da- – that's the most dangerous thing is – but most people, like, when their dog is itching, they think that antihistamines are going to help. Hmm. But the histamine pathway in pruritus or itchiness in dogs is only maybe 1% or 2%, so it really doesn't do much. Uh, the, one of the problems that used to exist that we don't really see much of now is people giving Tylenol to cats. Tylenol will kill cats. Wow. It's toxic to the liver. So even though people are told know that. people yeah. are told to take Tylenol for a headache, yeah. it can still be dangerous to people. I won't take Tylenol because of possible liver damage, especially mm. if you drink alcohol. Right. It's not the greatest thing in the world to do. Um, but I think most people have heard about that, and they don't do it to cats. Interesting. Um, so some some of those other home remedies, remedies home home treatments. Um, when a when a person's dealing with their pet, how often, uh, in your medical opinion, should a person bring their their pet in for that routine ch- checkup? Probably twice a year. Okay. Because their lifespan is much shorter than ours. Changes take place in a shorter time period, and if they just come in once a year, a lot of people say, "Well, he's due for his exam in three months. I'll wait," and by then, whatever has been happening in that pet could be too late to treat. Hmm. go in, get it taken care of. If you had a toothache, you would not wait for your dental appointment for cleaning in six months. True. You'd, you'd call the dentist and say, I'm in pain, I have to come in. Yeah. What type of things should a, a person look for in their pet? Um, you know, just a, a change in their disposition or personality as a... It's change is the biggest thing. Decreased appetite, loss of appetite, vomiting, diarrhea, lethargy. Not wanting to go out for long walks, resisting walks when mm. they normally would walk for two miles a day. Now they go to the end of the block and they want to come back. Something's wrong. A limping pet, a pet that a cat that's been in the same place for the last two days, that's a very sick pet. Hmm. That pet is not engaging, looking out the window, chasing birds, wanting to run around the house a little yeah. bit. Something's wrong. Pets have to hide their diseases because in the wild, a pet that shows he is weakened by a disease now becomes prey. Prey, yeah. Interesting. So they hide it, and the people say, oh, he's getting older, he has arthritis. We make a million excuses because our lives are complicated. 
We don't want to call the vet. It's probably going to be $200. I don't want to spend the money. And then they realize that something's really, really wrong with their pet. So bringing it to we, – we show up to the vet, and we consumers with our extended family members, the four-legged type or the two-legged flying type or what, whatever your, your family member is that's not a human being but part of the family – Um, when we're bringing them in to, um, a veterinarian like yourself and the professional, what type of things should we be asking you? And and we have, you know, like I go to my personal physician, I have probably 15 seconds to tell them my life. And then they're like, Hey, you know, I got 13 other patients down the hallway here. I've got to walk into what's different with a veterinarian. When I come in to see you, how much time what's your attention span for some novice like me when i ran my own practice the minimum time i would spend with a patient would be a half hour Hmm. if it was a new patient or a new client i gave them one hour wow because i wanted them to tell me everything that's going on with their pet a new a new pet would come in with a stack of records There's no way I could read that record in a 15-minute exam or a a seven-and-a-half-minute exam. Mm. Some things can be done in seven-and-a-half minutes, like a suture removal. Other things need time. When people come in, they they tell me things. I write them down. I'm thinking. Then there are secondary questions that I have to ask. When did it start? Is that a chronic problem? Has that been going on for three months now? Or did you only notice it last week? Mm. And the chronicity and the acuteness of problems may mean a different prognosis. You have to become like Columbo, right? You have to become a detective. Like Sherlock Holmes. Yeah. The medical yeah. detective. Yeah. Absolutely. You have no idea what it is when they come in. And by asking people, because they're my eyes and my ears, it's like walking into a movie. If someone showed you a, a clip of a movie in the middle, you wouldn't know what happened before and what's going to happen after. Yeah. My clients know everything about that pet. They walk their dog. They know the consistency of their feces because they pick them up, Hmm. especially in New York. Everyone knows their dog's bowel movement. They could pick them out. If there were 10 in the street, they could pick out their dogs because they pick it up every day. They know what it looks like, the color, the consistency, the timing of it. So the pet owner has all the answers It's my job by asking questions to get them to tell me the answers. Hmm. And I was trained at the Animal Medical Center in Manhattan, and we used to kid around and say, you should almost know the entire diagnosis by watching the dog walk in from the waiting room and speaking to the owner. Before you lay your hands Hmm. on that pet, you should have an idea of where you want to go and what you're looking for. Otherwise, you're blind. Yeah. And I hate to say this about my colleagues, but for veterinarians who may not put in all the extra time to study and put in all the extra hours of continuing education, this is a terrible thing to say, but the the people who aren't as astute make more money than other veterinarians because they're doing a lot of testing Hmm. that may not be warranted. I may know exactly where I want to go and decide on the tests, where other people may say, well, I'm not sure what's going on, so why don't we just do x-rays and blood tests and urine and still not put it all together because they don't know what's going on. Mm. I remember speaking to a veterinarian. I will not mention names nor initials. And he said, I just felt like if I checked off enough boxes on the lab form, something would come back positive. That's not the way you practice. Mm. For you, that's like saying, well, I'm hoping that some of the things I'm recommending – may be beneficial to you, you're not going to get many people coming back. Yeah, let's just do them all. Let's just do them all. Let's just see what works. Let's put up the flagpole and see who salutes. That's right. Yeah. That's interesting that 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 happens in a percentage of what a consumer would expect from, you know, and again, you can't lump veterinarians together. It's like trying to lump financial professionals together but exactly do, do you find that that's more common than not so what as a consumer as a, a uh this dual relationship between me as a dog or a cat owner or animal owner 
and bringing my pet in that's part of the family, what type of interview questions should I be asking uh, before you pick out your veterinarian? Before you pick them out. Where he or she went to school? Did they do postgraduate training? How much continuing education did they do? You can't ask about subspecialties because most people don't specialize. That's left for the, the specialty practices where we yeah. have board-certified cardiologists, board-certified surgeons, wow. internists, dermatologists, neurologists, oncologists. Same as human beings. Same as human beings. That's, they, get the, they get the things that I can't handle. I know my limitations. I give them everything past that. It's best that they're in the best of hands. So I would just say, are, are you available for emergencies, or do you refer me to the emergency clinic at night? Do you have any special qualifications? Do you, do, do, do you have an interest in surgery? Many veterinarians are very, very good in surgery. Yeah. So they, they, it, they can't become a specialist, but they have a special interest in surgery. Hmm. There are many people who consider themselves good dermatologists because they like dermatology. I kind of liked every aspect of veterinary yeah. medicine. So you were kind of the gatekeeper, it sounds like, for your, yeah. your patients. I did what I could in, in my limitations. Anything besides that, if I felt the dog needed a specialist, I'm going to recommend him. Period. Mm. That's the best thing for the pet. I was always taught, I'll take care of the pet that's on the table as if it was my mother's pet. Wow. You have to pass the mommy test. Uh -huh. If you're not going to do the best for your mom, you're not going to help anyone else. Mm. Mm. That's the best thing. If you're not going to do the best for your mom, you're not going to do it for anyone else. Who would you help? I love that. Yeah. Simple. Yeah. You know, that brings us to an hour. That's, that's a great way to close out our, uh, our video podcast. I could do this for two or three more hours with you, but, you know, we, we got to As long as you have Blue it, Label, but, I'll right. come back. So let's do it again in the future. I, I always like to ask folks um, before we close out the show, um, you know, things that you're, you're getting joy from currently. Maybe it's a book. I, any books right now you're reading that uh, folks might want to? I just listened to a book on tape. It was from James Patterson called Cajun Justice. And it was about Cajun justice. Cajun justice. It was about a guy who was from New Orleans or New Orleans, New Orleans, yeah. New Orleans, who was a Secret Service agent who got pushed out wrongfully, and then went to work f as a bodyguard for a CEO in Japan where his sister was working. And the guy who narrated the the book on tape is from New Orleans, and I did not want it to end. Cajun Justice by James Patterson. Wow, that's a great, great endorsement. Great book, yeah. and I get nothing from it. Yeah, just pure joy. Well, we'll put it up on uh, on the website and, and put a link on it. Yeah, I guess you can get to it from Amazon or I, I get yeah. the library. Yeah, I get. You, oh, from, you got yours. I get them from the library. That's awesome. Yeah. audio tapes for free from yeah. the library. If you're a resident of Virginia Beach, Virginia so, Beach, yeah, and, and they'll call you, they'll email you, they'll tell you when it's ready to be picked up, and you have three weeks to listen to it. I listen to a book on tape when I'm going to work and returning from work. It gives me peace of mind. Wow. It's not studying. It's easy to follow. Yeah. So I probably That's do cool. a, a book every two weeks. Really? Yeah. Plus, what was, well, before Cajun Justice, what was the uh, – do you remember the last one? Oh, the put problem, you on the spot. The problem is I read three books at a time. I read two hardcover books at home and one a book on tape, so I forget the titles. Wow. You know, I um, – I heard from Jack Canfield, you know, uh, The Success Principles. If you've never read this, it's a great book. No. Great business book. Um, but one of the recommendations that he gives is, you know, folks will say, I just don't have time to read. And he says, well, here's what's interesting. Ten pages a day of anything, and you've read uh, 3,650 pages a year. That's ten books a year, if not more. That's exactly right. So, you know, when you think about that in time, anybody, I think I could sit on the toilet. Right, Ian? Right. Uh, read a whole book. Read a <laughs> Easy, <laughs> easy. But 10 pages a day is not a lot. And I, I, try, to, I try to practice that. I'll, I'm always trying to, you know, further my education and everything just because I'm a curious person. It's why I decided to do podcasts is I'm curious about lots of professions and what makes people tick. And obviously today, Dr. Stuffler, we've found what makes you tick. 
And uh, thank you so much for sharing your story. My pleasure. And your passion about animals. And um, get your vets uh, in front of a, a great veterinarian. Uh, where you're practicing right now, we'll, we'll throw a shout out right I'm now. I'm practicing at the Banfield Pet Hospital in Great Bridge on Battlefield at Boulevard, I believe it is, in uh, yeah. Chesapeake. Yeah. Beautiful little place. Awesome. Wonderful staff. Great. That's a great endorsement. There, there you go, Banfield. Dr. Stuffler's uh, taking care of the family there. Um, thank you so much today. We enjoy the, uh, the information and learning from you. Uh, Thanks for having me. I love your passion uh, with animals. It's it's very cool. Thanks for coming out today. You're welcome. I think uh, Be, uh, B, the master, is waiting is waiting for you. We'll get some pictures of that. And okay, sounds great. Some, all right, sounds good. Thanks, man. Thank you. Thank you.